Welcome to Collegial Conversations with Diana Clark, the professional webinar series that offers clinical and personal perspectives on issues that are common, but often not talked about. Here is today's Collegial Conversation. Thank you for joining a Collegial Conversation with Diana Clark. Joining Diana today is Dr. Jeff Ball, who is the CEO and Executive Director of Psychological Care and Healing Center, where he created a treatment and business model emphasizing clinical best practices. Dr. Ball is also a psychoanalytically trained clinician in private practice. Today, Diana and Dr. Ball will be discussing various forms of psychoanalytic models and ethics in the behavioral health field. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Ball. I'll now pass the conversation over to Diana. Thank you, Laura, and welcome, Dr. Ball. I'm going to call you Jeff for the duration of That's what I prefer. So Great, great. So let's start with what kind of models are there? When I think about behavioral health models, I sort of break it down into the two groups of medical models and less medical model. So I know it's broader than that, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it. You know, um, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I, I actually, um, we we are a psychological treatment center, which, and we are mainly psychosocial models. We use psychiatry as an adjunct, which is very different than what's going on in the world where the medical model dominates behavioral health. I actually think it's probably, uh, when they talk about a, psych, a uh, biopsychosocial model, I think it should be a psychosocial bio model. In terms of the importance of each of each area, um, we uh, at PCH don't really accept the concept of mental illness. We're not a medical model. We don't think in terms of disorder. We think in terms of human experience, and that um, all of us um, struggle with different experiences during life. And the idea that we're kind of all in this together is, is our, our approach to dealing with psychological problems and issues. I'll give you an example. During the lockdown, um, there was a lot of talk about um, mental disorders and how young people, I think I read one article said six out of 10 young people um, have a mental disorder now during the lockdown of depressive disorders, anxiety disorder, and OCD. Um, my response was, what's going on with the other four? Because all of us were depressed. We were anxious. There was a deadly pandemic. We didn't know what was causing it or how you caught it. Um, and all of us were checking our groceries and uh, hypervigilant, all symptoms of OCD. And to me, it was a great example of how the medical model largely looks at the problem of being in the person's head. They ignore the context. If you look at the DSM, it ignores context for these things. And if you look at context, it often changes how we look at everything. And so, you know, my view is that was a great example, the pandemic of all of us going into depressive, anxious, OCD kind of states. That I think all of us do. I think I don't believe in the in the whole idea of borderline personality. Um, I used to teach about it and all the different so, theories. Yeah, what do you believe in of the symptoms or the behavior that that other people call borderline personality disorder? How do you characterize? I think they're it? trauma reactions. I think that um, all of us have trauma triggers. Some have many more than others. Um, I have my triggers that will send me zero to a hundred. And, um, I think the difference is with people that we treat, they have many more triggers and they have a harder time getting out of those states. And so the way we work with people is not to pathologize them, but to tell them that they've had significant trauma, they get dysregulated, they have a hard time trusting people when they're dysregulated. And we're going to give you tools and more insight into how to manage those states. And to me, it's much more, you know, one thing I've had, I've had parents say to me, you know, what's your cure rate? And I say, it's not a zero. Um, there's no cure for the human condition, but we're going to help you. If, if you work with us, we're going to help you learn to manage it in much better ways and have a really productive life. Um, 
So that's how I look at that. You know, it's interesting. I think there are many things within the medical model that are very defensive kinds of diagnoses. I think that when someone is sitting with their psychiatrist who is questioning them from kind of on high about their symptoms, and I think that often the way that the me- the medical gaze kind of looks at people, it's it's very much a collection of symptoms, and I think it feel I think it triggers a trauma response. And many people who've who've had that kind of trauma of misattunement in life, it triggers that. They get angry, and medicine tends to blame the patient when they're angry. So they call them a borderline um, and say that they're going to, you know, and then they go Google it, and they see they're going to have this the rest of their lives. And I think it's a terrible stigma to put somebody with. Mm -hmm. Um, The reality is, if you look up complex trauma, it's the same symptoms as what they call borderline personality. Um, Same thing with even schizophrenia. I think it's become a garbage category for all psychoses. And psychosis is caused by multiple things, including trauma. You know, I saw something where somebody was saying it's not fair to pathologize uh, teens that are anxious and include them with people who are homeless and hearing voices. Well, I think if any of us were homeless and Um, you know, you're out on the streets and it's dangerous and people get raped and killed and robbed and they don't sleep well at night. I think a lot of us be hearing voices in that context. So again, I'm really big on seeing, you know, there's a great TED talk by a woman named Eleanor Longdon who says doctors need to stop asking what's wrong with you and ask what happened to you. And that's really our approach. What happened to you? Yeah. I like your concept about taking what we call symptoms into context. I'm reminded of the, you know, the aging woman who loses her husband who is all over the place, but nobody asks about the loss of her husband. They're just looking at her cognitive capacity, her emotional all over the place. And it was a response to a situation that was probably even functional. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a great example of that. As I, I was reading on Twitter, um, and a woman said her husband had just died, and she called his psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist asked how she was doing, and she said, I'm depressed and I'm sad. And the psychiatrist said, I can give you something for that. And the woman said, aside from the fact I think it's part of what killed my husband, um, aren't I supposed to feel sad and depressed? My husband just died. And the psychiatrist said, yes, but you don't have to. Um, our approach is that you do have to, that okay. you have to experience that loss and and the symptoms in order to work through them and come out stronger. Um, which So, you know, we at, at PCH, for example, um, we work with integrative psychiatrists who use medication as their last line of treatment, not the first. And, you know, there's lots of research about how antidepressants aren't effective, particularly. They're no more than placebo in most cases. And they have terrible side effects, which I don't even like to call them side effects because it minimizes them, but negative effects. Um, You know, I think 95% of the people taking an SSRI have a sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And the reality is sometimes when people get off the SSRI, it doesn't come back fully. And so that's a pretty severe consequence to taking a medication that's not particularly effective and maybe short-circuiting your ability to heal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what do you find healing? If we're, if we're going to say medication only when absolutely necessary, what else works? The relationship. I mean, I, you know, and, and I've talked with my psychiatrist um, who's a bit, one of our psychiatrists is a bit older school psychiatrist, but he totally agrees with me that, but he also spends 45 minutes to an hour with all of his patients, which is, I told him he's a unicorn among psychiatrists. Um, I think that relationship is what heals. And, you know, it's interesting because I trained originally, I trained behaviorally and then became an analyst and did all that. I don't think the models matter all that much. I think it's the relationship and that 
the models are more for the for the therapist what they're comfortable with whether they need the structure of a more behavioral approach or the free floating kind of analytic approach i think that those are all ways in to to a relationship and whatever works that relationship is where the healing happens and there was a great quote from harry guntrip once where he said it's so easy for us to accept that bad relationships cause problems why don't we think good relationships can be healing? And that's really what our approach is, that we use multiple therapeutic models with the idea that not, not everything works for everyone. You know, we do DBT skills, but we don't, I know programs where all they do is DBT. Well, a lot of people don't resonate with DBT or don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a great tool to have, but in addition to lots of other kinds of tools and different approaches. So... If I were thinking through some bad example, I'm thinking about the client and the therapist connecting in a genuine way and both brains actually calming down, right? That's, that's my understanding of how the brain can work. So in that process, a calm brain, a connected brain can receive information in ways that brains otherwise have difficulty no question i always say when someone's really dysregulated it's you can't really talk to them because reality testing's out of the way out of the window and they're just not in a place where they can really hear you because their their nervous system's just too activated mm -hmm. so we tend to use like i said we do um individual therapy every day we do different approaches depending on what the issues are um, and uh, we do like 100 groups or something like that. But we also, we do in our individual work, well, actually in groups too, we do both top-down approaches, which are more psychotherapy, understanding, more insight. But we do a lot of sort of bottom-up approaches to help the nervous system to regulate because you can't do the top-down approach if the bottom, if, if your nervous system isn't regulated. And how odd they're connected. Exactly. The head and the body are connected. We like to treat them as as if they're different forms of being. Yeah. And, and you know, and the problem, my problem with the medical models, it, it, it's as though this problem is in the brain, and I think they're mostly relational. I think they have to do with the context of where the person is. Um, and so, the bottom up approaches are things like somatic experiencing. We do sensory motor psychotherapy. Um, we do EMDR. We do a lot of yoga to help the body rhythms regulate. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of aerobic exercise, for example, works better than antidepressants and, and benzos. Um, we don't use benzos at all. We don't use any addictive medications. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our general approach to medication is it's in the service of the relationship that if someone is too depressed to get out of bed to make it into therapy, they need something to help them to, to move and get up. So they might need a short-term antidepressant. Um, nothing ever long term. If you if you're manic, you need a mood stabilizer to be able to sit in a room with someone. If you're psychotic, you might need a low dose antipsychotic to be able to get. But it's the all mood. about being able to not be out in the world and pretend you're normal. But the purpose of the medication is to further the therapeutic relationship. Definitely, it's all about it's all about the relationship. I think even. You know, I worked at the VA for many years and people were over medicated, misdiagnosed, and um, it was frustrating. And, you know, the idea was if someone's psychotic, you can't talk to them, which, you know, people aren't psychotic all the time. Right. Um, it does. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a lot of it's defensive. I think I once heard um, a guy named Bert Karam, who's a schizophrenia expert, do a talk, and he said that people who have schizophrenia, um, they are more in touch with the kind of the dark primordial part of human nature and that that scares people. Mm -hmm. And so doctors often want to medicate them and quiet them down. Mm -hmm. I think distress scares people, whether it's accompanied by psychosis or not. Distress scares all of us at this point. We mm -hmm. have very little tolerance for being next to somebody in distress without wanting to make the distress disappear. Which is why doctors, their treatment for women in the 50s, 60s, probably beyond, who were anxious, was to give them tranquilizers. 
and quiet them down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of my issue too with the whole medical model and the DSM, I think 97% of DSM diagnoses have no proven biological basis. It's a political document where doctors get together and decide what's normal and what isn't. They're mostly older white male doctors. And so it's very biased against women. It's biased against uh, people of color. Um, so I, I, you know, if someone asked me, you know, do I find it useful? It's, it's a good doorstop and you need it for insurance reimbursement. Got it. Got it. So I'm just going to recap capitulate and basically say, so the real fundamental key here is relationship. It is what heals. Yeah. And, and I think people need to have good training in terms of, of yeah. how to, how to do that and keep good boundaries with people. And, um, but I, I, I do believe that's what really ultimately heals. That's great. Well, thank you, Dr. Ball. That's a really important point you made today. It isn't about the medicine. It's about the relationship. And I appreciate mm -hmm. you joining me. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you for joining this webinar. Tune in to more webinars and sign up for our newsletter at O'ConnorPG.com.